Did you force yourself on me? I silently nodded in response to the question from my beautiful CEO, Emily Roberts. No way, that's disgusting. Get out of my sight immediately. She shouted at and insulted me, I was thrown out of the hospital room. I never imagined that saving a life would make me so hated. A few days later, I was called to Ms. Roberts' office, where she glared at me from her desk. You don't think you can get away with what you did, do you? How do you plan to take responsibility? I understand. I'll take responsibility and quit. Please fire me. Suddenly, Ms. Roberts appeared flustered. My name is Mike. I work in a somewhat unusual office. Walking on a gray tile carpet and opening a heavy door, and there is my desk right before the CEO's office. After sitting at my desk, I booted up my computer before Ms. Roberts arrived and reviewed her schedule for the day. Then, I selected the lunch menu for the web meeting with the executives scheduled for the next day, input their addresses, and made reservations with the catering service. I also contacted an IT company to confirm next week's consultation appointment. Yes, my job is a secretary. A personal secretary to the CEO, to be precise. It might seem odd for a man to be a CEO's secretary, but it's becoming more common in companies nowadays. Generally, a secretary's job is to support the executive comprehensively. In the public sector, this might be a career path to promotion. But in the private sector, that's not the case. Excuse me. There was a knock on the door. After I called out, a female staff member from the secretarial department entered, saying the ordered business cards had arrived. She placed Ms. Roberts and my business cards on the desk and left the room. I took some of my business cards and set them in my card holder. Mike Williams, Secretarial Department. The title still doesn't feel quite right. If I were a political secretary, like a chief of staff or senior secretary, I could be proud. But as a mere secretary in a private company? There's nothing to boast about. However, given my personality, I prefer supporting others from the background rather than standing out, so this role suits me. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Roberts. She is the CEO of this company, Emily Roberts, a beautiful woman. What's today's schedule? Yes. At 10 a.m., there's a meeting with George from Continent Trading. At 1 p.m., there's a web lunch meeting with Mr. Smith, the director of the Western Division, and at 4 p.m., I informed Ms. Roberts of her schedule and served her coffee at her desk. You're only good at making coffee. Thank you. Such small teases from her were expected. I've already gotten used to her personality. I returned to my desk and started preparing the presentation materials for the event Ms. Roberts would be speaking at over the weekend. As a child, I preferred drawing and playing house with the neighborhood girls inside rather than playing outside. My father wanted to play baseball or soccer with me, but I preferred baking cookies and cooking with my mother, which disappointed him. My reserved nature meant I didn't stand out, but I always helped classmates with chores and tasks they disliked without complaining. My meticulous nature made me a reliable person to my teachers and classmates because I always completed their requests perfectly. By high school, I had developed a knack for observing my peers and predicting potential trouble. Advising classmates and listening to the girls' concerns, I became known as a considerate person by the time I graduated. Mike, you have such high girl skills. If you were a girl, I'd totally marry you. Classmates often said things like that, and in my teens, I focused on being a reliable person while avoiding the spotlight. But that was just a facade. In reality, I'm not that nice guy. I only act like a nice person for my own benefit. I have never thought about doing anything for others. I realized in middle school that pretending to be a good person and gaining trust was highly beneficial for me. Because of that, my grades improved, and I wasn't bullied by my classmates. I could get people to do favors for me, and when there was a disagreement in class, my opinion usually prevailed. This was all calculated. Even my parents, who wanted me to be more masculine, didn't understand my true nature. You're quiet because of your personality, but it's your life. So live it as you like, they said. No one ever saw through my true self. Using the same strategy, I gained the favor of my college professors, and without even needing to wear a recruitment suit. I secured a job at a well-known large company through a professor's recommendation. 
In the future, I aim to stay close to the CEO and the secretarial department, get in her good graces, and eventually hold a position where I can influence the board meetings. This became my goal the moment I was assigned to the secretarial department. Early on, I was summoned to the executive room by the chairman, Mr. Parker, who asked me to support Ms. Roberts as her personal secretary. I had initially intended to apply for an administrative role, but it seems there was already an agreement between my professor and Mr. Parker. And I had no choice from the start. Mr. Parker was looking for someone who could firmly speak to and support his daughter. My meticulous nature and considerate personality, which Professor Johnson had mentioned, convinced him I was suitable to support her. Thus, I was assigned to the secretarial department the day after joining the company and became Ms. Roberts' secretary. Working closely with Ms. Roberts, I found that while she was beautiful, she was somewhat sloppy and struggled with organization and considering others' feelings. Mr. Parker's words, more of a babysitter than a secretary, initially seemed like a joke, but they started to feel more accurate over time. I supported Ms. Roberts diligently, albeit with a wry smile. From the first day, I not only followed her instructions but also took care of cleaning and organizing the CEO's office in her absence and perfectly timed serving coffee. I studied other CEOs' behaviors and learned the necessary skills for an executive, such as how to communicate and present oneself to external parties. Moreover, I studied essential managerial skills like sensing market trends and flexible communication, making suggestions to her. However, Ms. Roberts often rejected my well-intentioned efforts, saying, I didn't ask you to do that. What do you understand who have never managed? Just do what I tell you and don't interfere with me. Her stubbornness was partly my fault. On business trips, she was often looked down upon or treated coldly just because she was a woman. And she dealt with the stress of a male-dominated environment daily. Sometimes, she was even compared to me in a derogatory way. He's more suited to be the CEO than you. It's not enough to just have a pretty face. After hearing such comments, she would always drag me out for a drink. Ms. Roberts, you should stop now. There's a web meeting tomorrow, let's go home. Shut up. You're always meddling in my business. How I talk or behave is none of your concern. You're so annoying. And she would continue drinking until she passed out. Ms. Roberts, who was weak to alcohol, would always pass out and sometimes even forget what happened. Good morning. Here, have some of this. The day after heavy drinking, I would always place a bowl of soup on her desk. This is the best for hangovers. Ms. Roberts would slowly bring the steaming bowl to her lips and sip it. Delicious. Seeing her calm expression, I would start my work for the day. She eventually developed a routine of starting her day with either soup or coffee I made. However, being a CEO seems to come with a lot of stress. The frequency of her heavy drinking gradually increased, and each time I would take care of Ms. Roberts and advise her to quit drinking. But no matter how much I asked her to stop, she never listened. You're so presumptuous for a secretary. What I drink is none of your business. You're so persistent. One time, Ms. Roberts was harshly criticized by Mr. Thompson from a client company, who compared her unfavorably to her predecessor, Mr. Parker, and dismissed her business vision. On the way back, I accompanied her for a drink as usual, but she was more deeply dejected than ever before, slumping against the wall in despair. Seeing her like that was hard for me as well. While I was searching for words to comfort her, she quickly succumbed to the alcohol. Predictably, she felt sick midway and collapsed in the restroom, so I had no choice but to take her to my place. The next morning, she woke up and, realizing she was in my room, suddenly panicked. Ah, my head, why am I in your room? Did you? Ms. Roberts started checking her clothes. You passed out, so I let you sleep in my bed. Don't worry, I didn't do anything. I hanged your jacket over there. Well. I see. I had her take a shower while I prepared breakfast. This feels a bit strange, having breakfast together with you, Ms. Roberts. Here, your usual soup. But she seemed different from her usual self, looking rather down. She didn't touch her spoon, and the soup got cold. Are you feeling unwell? Or is there something hurting you? I asked. Ms. Roberts responded, I'm fine. But why do you care so much about me? 
It seems beyond the scope of your job. Really? It's just an extension of my job. Nothing more than that. I see. She answered sadly for some reason. After that, we got ready and headed to the office together. Feeling remorseful for staying at my place, she declared she would stop drinking from that day. A few days after her declaration, a company drinking party was suddenly organized, and for some reason, Ms. Roberts was strongly encouraged by the employees to join them in the cafeteria. It turned out to be Ms. Roberts' birthday. The employees had secretly prepared a surprise birthday party for her. Although she was surprised, Ms. Roberts appreciated their thoughtfulness and took her seat. And then the employees opened champagne and poured it into her glass. I sent her a look that said absolutely do not drink and suddenly shook my head, but she couldn't refuse their goodwill. Thank you. I'll have some. She said and drank it down in one gulp. Encouraged by this, the employees said, oh, Ms. Roberts can drink? She's the star today, so come on, have some more. And they started pouring her drinks one after another. I watched nervously but felt a bit relieved seeing her surprisingly sharp. However, after she went to the restroom, I had a bad feeling and quietly followed her. As expected, I found her collapsed face down in the hallway just before the restroom. I rushed over and, while scolding her, helped her sit against the wall. Ms. Roberts, are you okay? I told you not to drink so much. I quickly grabbed a plastic bag and filled it with mineral water, then fetched a blanket. When I returned, she was breathing heavily, and suspecting acute alcohol poisoning, I urged her to drink water. I can't. I can't drink anymore. I feel so sick. She responded with slurred speech, but I had to dilute her blood alcohol level. Things are getting blurry, ah. Excuse me. I held the plastic bag to her mouth and made her vomit by sticking my fingers down her throat. Now, drink some water. I told you. I'm full. You have to drink. If you don't, you might pass out. But she was so full and she refused to drink. Oh, this is frustrating. Excuse me. After a quick apology, I loosened her collar slightly and gave her water mouth to mouth. Ms. Roberts seemed to lose consciousness. I quickly called the company doctor. Leaving her with the doctor for a moment, I returned to the party to explain to the employees. Ms. Roberts had an urgent matter to attend to and had to leave. I hid the truth to avoid worrying them and let the party continue as a regular company gathering. I returned to Ms. Roberts, and to be safe, drove her to the hospital. She was given a drip and fortunately was not in serious danger. The doctor advised her to stay overnight just in case, so I called Mr. Parker, but he was too busy to come right away. So I stayed with her for the night. The next day, Ms. Roberts woke up without any issues and was told by the doctor that my first aid, making her drink water, had saved her. How did you make me drink water when I was unconscious? I stammered at her sudden question, and her face quickly turned pale. Did you force yourself on me? Faced with Ms. Roberts' intense gaze, I looked away and nodded yes silently. No, that's impossible. Disgusting. Get out of my sight right now. Shouting and throwing a pillow at me, she chased me out of the hospital room. Why am I being treated so unfairly when I saved her life? This is what's really impossible. I muttered angrily to myself as I quietly left. A few days later, Ms. Roberts was discharged and went on a three-day business trip, leaving me on standby at home. Mr. James prefers lighter meals than this menu. Also, since this place is popular, you should make a reservation three days in advance. Thank you, Mike. You really know everything. Three days later, back at the office, I supported the female employees in the secretarial department until Ms. Roberts returned. In the afternoon, I was summoned to the CEO's office. When I opened the door, Ms. Roberts was waiting with a stern look on her face. I stood in front of her desk and asked firmly, What can I do for you? After a brief silence, Ms. Roberts spoke. You don't think you can get away with what you did, do you? How do you plan to take responsibility? Responsibility? Ms. Roberts, I performed a life-saving act because you were at risk of acute alcohol poisoning. It's your excessive drinking. Despite my warnings, that caused this. I responded indignantly, making her face turn red with anger. 
Still, forcing water into an unconscious woman with mouth to mouth is disgusting. Being called disgusting made me angry, and I replied sharply. Let me be clear. My job is to support you. Protecting your life is part of that duty. There was no other way to get you to drink water. Can you swear that's the truth? Only you know what's in your heart. You could say anything. Frustrated by her misunderstanding, I was fed up. If you can't trust me, just fire me right away. I said bitterly, although she seemed a bit flustered, she declared firmly. Fine. You're fired. Don't come in tomorrow. Are you sure? Even if I'm gone? When I asked quietly, she showed obvious agitation. There are plenty of secretaries. You're not special. Don't be conceited. All right then, thank you for everything. I turned around and reached for the door handle. Wait. You're fired starting tomorrow. Do your job properly today. Stopping by the door, I returned to my desk without meeting her eyes and started working. After 5 p.m., I finished the handover notes for my successor, completed some meeting materials for the week, and attached Ms. Roberts' schedule for the month before shutting down my computer. Then, I approached her desk and spoke softly. Ms. Roberts, today is my last day. But I have one last thing to say. She looked up at me with a slightly tense expression. When you feel belittled because of your youth or gender, take a breath before speaking. You tend to get emotional. So be particularly careful about that. I placed her usual coffee on the desk. I've documented how to make this coffee and how to interact with clients in the handover notes, so please rest assured. After saying that, I thanked her and opened the heavy door. As I closed the door, I glanced back and saw Ms. Roberts standing up, looking like she wanted to say something. But I quietly closed the door and left the company. After quitting, I felt a sense of loss and lethargy, spending my days idly at home. One day, I received a call from my successor. It seemed there was trouble with continent trading, and the contract was on the verge of being cancelled. Ms. Roberts is doing her best, but Mr. Thompson won't budge. The executives keep telling me to consult with you. I'm not an employee at the company anymore. You need to support Ms. Roberts properly. I retorted, but the secretary pleaded desperately. I can't do it. Ms. Roberts wants you back. She always looks at the coffee cup you gave her, looking lonely. She's surely thinking of you. I listened silently to the secretary's words. The client, Mr. Thompson, insists that Ms. Roberts attend the meeting alone. As a secretary, I don't know what to do. But I cut off the secretary's rambling call and lay back on the couch. What happens to her is none of my concern. I'm not involved anymore. Really not. Trying to convince myself of that, I lay on the bed and closed my eyes, but the image of Ms. Roberts working so hard still came to mind. Being underestimated as a young woman, treated like a child, and striving desperately to prevent unfavorable contracts. Why do I keep thinking about her? Why am I thinking about her so much when I never worked for her sake? Continent trading. Ha! Huh? Wait. Mr. Thompson, that must be it. I called the secretary back and asked for the date and time of the meeting, making some preparations. On the day of the meeting, I arrived at a certain restaurant. This was a secluded, quiet place in the mountains, often used for hosting important clients. I timed my entrance carefully. I made eye contact with the familiar owner and was led to a specific room. When I reached the room, I dismissed the owner and slowly opened the sliding door. As expected, Ms. Roberts, drunk and unable to stand, was being held by Mr. Thompson. What the hell are you doing here? Nice to see you again, Mr. Thompson. I'm Mike. What are you doing here? This meeting is supposed to be private. Mr. Thompson, already red-faced from drinking, shouted even more angrily. Ms. Roberts is too drunk to negotiate properly. I've brought someone else to join us. With that, I invited into the room Tom, the chairman of Continent Trading, and Mr. Parker. Both of them frowned as they looked down at Mr. Thompson. Tom and Mr. Parker. Dad. Ms. Roberts, still dazed, saw her father approach with a smile. Mr. Thompson, I'm sorry to show you our top executive in such a state. Thank you for looking after her. 
Mr. Parker's tone was gentle, but his face, deeply furrowed with anger, glared at Mr. Thompson. Uh, well, she just drank a little too much and got dizzy. Mr. Thompson stammered, clearly panicked. Mr. Tom then shouted, disgraceful, and promised to contact us later, before leading Mr. Thompson out of the room. Left with the three of us, there was a moment of silence before Mr. Parker spoke up. It's disgraceful for a leader to show such a pathetic display. I'm sorry. I was offered alcohol and couldn't refuse. With Mr. Thompson gone, Ms. Roberts, now relieved, slumped against the wall. Mr. Thompson has been targeting Ms. Roberts for a while, waiting for an opportunity like this. He used this trouble to make his move. I explained, and Ms. Roberts, realizing how easily she was tricked, hung her head in regret. But she was safe. Feeling relieved, I decided to go home. I'll be taking my leave now. I said and headed to the door when Ms. Roberts called out to me. Wait. I still have something to say. Stopped by her, I turned around to see Ms. Roberts struggling to sit upright. I appreciate what you did today. I'm allowing you to return to the company. Please come back as my secretary. No, I decline. What? Why? I'm saying you can come back. I finally expressed what I'd been holding back. i have been supporting you as an executive, more than just an ordinary secretary. But you never listened to anything I said. Ms. Roberts, with a solemn expression, listened to me intently as I spoke. I might have been harsh at times, but it was because I wanted you to become a strong leader. That's why I said tough things. At some point, I found myself emotionally pouring out my feelings to her. Even when it came to making coffee, I always tried to prepare it in a way that would help you feel a bit calmer. But you never understood my feelings. That's not true. I knew. I knew you were doing so much for me, Mike, but I just couldn't say it. I couldn't say thank you. As we both struggled to find the right words, Mr. Parker broke the silence. Haha, ha, it seems neither of you could express your true feelings. You guys are still quite immature, aren't you? We could only stare at Mr. Parker without responding. Now that you've finally shared your feelings, why not go back to being partners? Surprised, we looked at each other, and our faces turned bright red the moment our eyes met. I also ask you, Mike. Please support Emily, both professionally and personally. What? Personally. Yes. You see, in our family, there's a tradition of marrying the first person you kiss. It would be a shame to disregard our ancestors' wishes. Stunned by Mr. Parker's words, I was at a loss for words. Or do you find Emily unacceptable? Mr. Parker's expression hardened as he questioned me. No. Ms. Roberts is wonderful. But our social standings are different, and I'm not sure I'm suitable. I hesitated, but Ms. Roberts quickly interrupted. Looks and family background don't matter. I want you by my side, Mike. Her eyes seemed to glisten with a hint of tears as she looked up at me. Emily has said it herself. Please continue to support her. She's been so down since you left. She needs someone as reliable as you. But I knew Mr. Parker was asking because I was her first kiss. While I struggled to find an answer, Mr. Parker suddenly spoke again. Oh, don't worry about the family tradition. It's an old story, and it's no longer relevant. That's not the issue. I turned to Ms. Roberts. Emily, do you really want me? I sat beside her and gently asked. She nodded quietly yes. Then I leave her in your care, Mike. With a smile, Mr. Parker left the room, leaving us alone, both feeling a bit embarrassed and sharing a small, awkward laugh. Ms. Roberts, Mr. George from Continent Trading is on the line. How should I handle it? Tell him I'll call back in 30 minutes. Understood. I returned to the secretarial department, back to my role as her secretary. Continent Trading had changed their CEO, with a new female CEO from the UK. The chairman of Continent Trading arranged a meeting to introduce the new CEO and apologize for the previous incident, scheduled for tomorrow. Continuing my duties as a secretary, I requested to remain as the CEO's personal secretary, as before. This time, it wasn't to infiltrate the core of the company, but for a different purpose. I'll listen to your advice from now on, but please don't be too harsh. No, 
you've grown enough as an executive. There's nothing more I need to advise you on. Then why did you ask to stay as my secretary? She blinked in surprise. Well, no particular reason. I just want to keep an eye on any shady characters who might approach you. That's the enough reason. I'm glad to know you care about me. Now that no one's around, can you call me by my name? Since we started dating, Emily had become quite affectionate, perhaps because she had never had anyone to lean on before. This is the office, so we need to be professional. Hey, wait. All right, all right. But you have to make me soup every morning. Emily's newfound affectionate personality made me a bit uneasy. But as she wrapped her arms around my neck from behind, I resolved to support her wholeheartedly from now on.